investigations are usually a challenge. You know, when you look at all of the legal avenues for correction, mm. it is always safer when it's an adult who rapes a little girl or defiles some young woman. Mm. Then that is in a totally different context. Yeah. But now we have a case on our hands where very young adults are engaging in sexual activity mm. with each other. Now, it's an interesting debate, this question about if a young boy, you know, defiles a young girl, then is, is what's the right way forward? You know, do you prosecute this young boy and send him to the juvenile center? That would also end his, his life. Uh, that could also end his, uh, you know, his life, his future and all of that. So uh, what's the way forward? But it's an interesting question. I'm wondering whether we are not creating a gray area where there ought not be one. And I'm, I'm, I'd love to bring Shamima into this, okay? Are we sort of making this uh, a lot more complicated than it actually is? If a 16-year-old boy steals, he will be prosecuted and sent to the, the, you know, the, the juvenile center if, if found guilty. So why should it be different for a 16-year-old boy who has sex? Sorry, a 15-year-old boy who has sex with a 13-year-old girl or a 12-year-old old girl. Why should it be any different? Well, um, 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 good morning once again. And uh, thanks for having me. And good morning to my colleague, panelist. Um, I think that... Um, at the core of the conversation around these issues where children are having sex with um, children, it's mm. also the thing about um, being pragmatic and being realistic. Um, because in this case, they are all children. And obviously, they perhaps do not know better. So I guess, depending on, on, on the... Um, the, the decision of the adults in the life of these children, um, depending on the choices they make at mm. the core of it, must be what is in the best interest of the child. And um, not to make it seem like having sex or impregnating a girl is okay, because obviously it has dire consequences. And just this morning, as I was reflecting, on 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 you know what what else to share on this matter mm. i i i was thinking that i mean having a child is serious business yeah. and perhaps as part of the comprehensive public education obviously we are calling everyone is calling for um a return of some public campaign and education of of a sort mm. Because um, the, 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 the silence is not good enough. And yeah. I think the, si the silence lends itself to all kinds of... When there's a gap, it has to be filled. And if you're not filling that gap with the right information, with the right tools, with the right, you know, um, you know attitudes, people will fill it in with whatever they want. And I think that's one of the reasons the myths surrounding all of these things, the information sharing amongst young people, because sometimes you don't even know where they get access to some of these pills and all kinds of funny things regarding how not to get pregnant, concoctions that they share amongst hmm. themselves. So when you don't put give the right information to young people, they will generate the information themselves. Yeah. And at the end of the day, to be... Um, they will be worse off for it. So I think that the, the response to the young people impregnating young people requires a more in-depth and a pragmatic approach beyond just the, the easier option of saying, okay, send all the boys impregnating girls to juvenile center mm. to go and learn a lesson on abstinence. So I think these are the conversations we want to have. The specialists in these areas must all be part of this national conversation. And the campaign must obviously start like yesterday, hmm. bringing back the right values, the right messages, 
proper information, education, and communication. Because at the heart of what we are speaking about is behavioral change yeah. and attitudes. And even for adult populations, we all know that this whole thing about preventive, you know, um, mechanism is is difficult. That's why even now we hear the HIV rates, uh, HIV AIDS rates are spiking mm. again within young populations and um, adult populations because people are just not having res um, response, res res what do you call it, responsible intercourse. So if adults find it difficult to change their attitudes regarding some of these um, behaviors, how less children? And talking about that also, uh, it comes to mind, um, what was it that I wanted to say about the attitudinal change thing? Is like people are more fearful of getting pregnant than they are of contracting sexual diseases, mm. you know, <laughs> sexually transmitted diseases. So sometimes the bits confusing, you know, mm. what, what human beings fear, you know, yeah. it's almost like we really don't fear the things that have the potential of killing us. And even with the issue of COVID now, I think that there's, um, what was it that I shared recently? Um, apparently, the, the theory is that when we feel safe in terms of, okay, there are all these safety protocols, or we have a sense that we are a little protected, there's medication and all of that, if it's HIV, oh, I can leave for so long if I'm on antiretrovirals. If it's COVID, well, if I space myself or I don't even comply once the government is doing something about it and there's a vaccine, there's a false sense of, you know, feeling safe. And that actually puts many people at risk mm. because of that false sense of, of feeling safe. So we, we have to have that national campaign, we have to throw in the right messages. We have to communicate to the targets. We also have to disaggregate the data. We obviously need an audit of um, the, pre the teenage pregnancy numbers. Also, who the persons are that are making the children, um, the, the girls pregnant. So we need to disaggregate them by adult males or um, young males. Mm. We also need to disaggregate uh, dis disaggregated data regarding in school youth and out of school youth because some of them are not in school at all. So uh, our data capturing those. Yes, on Friday we had one of the, um, the 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 persons in one of the districts tell us that there are many more people because the data we have are of those. Uh, pregnant teens, tricks are um, coming to play, the chiefs, the traditional mothers, because we need to capture the numbers, to know the numbers. Mm. In Accra, there was a time when we went to, uh, we did some work, um, you know, the coastal areas are also very, uh, they, they, they have very high rates of sexual activity true. and teenage pregnancy. Yeah. In uh, is it Bukom area or, you know, if you're 13, 14 and you have not had one or two and had a beautiful Pojemo, then the, the insult of choice by your colleagues for you is that you are infertile. Hmm. So all this subculture situation, because it's almost like an admirable thing hmm. for a young girl to be pregnant and have a child and have a little, a nice Pojemo for, hmm. you know, for your Friday that there's all... Um, there's this policy response uh, discussion paper that was presented by Professor um, Ellen Bote, the teenage pregnancies in schools. So amongst them is the thing, preaching of abstinence. Right. But we all know, and that's the ideal situation. Mm. Abstain and be safe until you're ready to, you know, be an adult yeah. and take part in adult business, mm. abstain. But they also call for um, stakeholder accountability in terms of um, various partners, because often 
partners engage in all kinds of interventions without you know proper collaboration so what we mm. do is we disperse our very scarce resources and there's no proper coordination of these efforts and so we are not able to track progress and to do the proper targeting mm. of of the, the interventions to the areas that most need it so they also so they speak about strengthening partnerships to address the challenge and i agree with that right. and of course creating safe and supporting environment for girls so that girls who are who have fallen pregnant or who uh, uh, have had children should not be um, stigmatized mm. you know by the society so we can encourage them that well it, it, it's a mistake because childbirth is such a serious business that it should be a matter of well thought out decision to have it mm. so getting pregnant should not be a mistake but mm. once it happens we should not stigmatize those that have fallen prey to that mistake we should also then be able to connect them to the necessary support services. So to wrap up um, on this edition, I also want to say that for many rural um, girls, some may be in school, some may not be in school. Look, the issue of shelter or space and food are the greatest determinants to them deciding to offer themselves out hmm. because they are living in one single room with a father and mother. Nancy Joyce and I mean my big sister Joyce knows this in, in our areas, in villages in um upper west and many other rural areas. A young girl once she hits teenage does not even have a place to lay her head. Her mother's room is full of children. Mm -hmm. So in the evening they are out. I mean, I went to work some time ago and it was 10 o'clock, it was 11. There were children playing outside because there's no source of entertainment. There's no television. Some do not even have lights. If they have lights, they don't have television. They are playing outside with each other. And I'm talking children like eight, nine year old. So by 11, some of these plays becomes mama and dada and it is people doing all kinds of things and they're exposed and by the time you realize even without tv and internet these children are having sex hmm. the tv the pornography influences more rural and uh, more urban, urban children yeah. those who have access but in the rural areas they don't have these influences yet the absence of 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 proper um activities to engage these children mm. and space and food lead them to do to fall into the same quagmire yeah. and their um, situation becomes worse yeah. because the poor mother who cannot even provide three square meal a day for these children is now saddled with another teenage daughter mm. who is pregnant Indeed. the cycle continues so this girl now moves on from man to man just so she can get food to feed herself yeah. and to feed her growing number of mm. children. Yeah. So um, it's a stark reality and we have to have this conversation about absolutely. it. Now, I know that we'll end up spending some time on, on this idea of a campaign, you know, a massive mm -hmm. media campaign to re-align uh, thinking of young people uh, to, to, uh, and, and prevent teenage pregnancy before it even happens. So we'll spend and I some have time on a that. controversial suggestion to make. So well, when we'll, it comes get, to, we'll point, get to that. Yes, we'll get yeah. to your, that and hear your <laughs> suggestion very soon. But I want to bring something in because I think history tells us that no educational campaign will ever succeed without robust enforcement. And that is where we seem to have a massive problem when it comes to teenage pregnancy in this country. I mean, the recent statistics, and I'm looking at uh, the statistics for 2020, uh, 2021 alone. Okay, this year, so far, when it comes to teenagers who have been impregnated in Ghana, those who are between the ages of 10 and 14 years, 2,865. Forgive me, that's for 2020. Forgive me. I'm giving you 2020 figures, okay? So between the ages of 10 and 14 years, 
2,865 of them. Samson, these are all crimes. Why do we not have 2,865 prosecutions? I mean, yes, some of them will be children, and we do have to debate that. But still, why don't we have thousands of prosecutions when the evidence is clear? I mean, the, there's pregnancy, so you even have DNA evidence. <laughs> why, why? Why do we not have the commensurate number of prosecutions? Well, could you? Um, yes, I'm a lawyer. Yes, I have become very familiar with some of these matters. And, uh, you know, I try to donate some of my time on Sundays at 2 p.m., trying to educate people. I do what I call the legal clinic, mm. but it's the show is uh, the law show. Yeah. And we try to educate people uh, on the law and to empower them mm. and to provide some sort of... Uh, some sort of help for yeah. them. It's on the Joy News channel yeah. on Sunday afternoons. That's right. Yeah. In the course of this conversation, I may give you hints of a very chilling story that had just come up. Um, after the show yesterday, mm. uh, but I'm bringing it in because I hosted two lawyers, one very senior and one my colleague of just uh, a little above 10 years of practice. Mm. And they all seem to agree that, um, like you have just said, the question of enforcement appears to be almost zero. And that is the situation. And so it's quite disappointing. Um, now, I, I, came to, I came to the office this morning about 5 p.m. because I have something that I need to wrap up quickly. I have a de deadline for today. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, from that period up till now, I have done zero to the work. The reason is, before I started the work, something just told me, don't check your phone. <laughs> I wanted to put the phone aside, but I felt, okay, you just check it before you go ahead. I checked, and my very good senior, Musa Ahmed, who was on the show um, yesterday, sent me a message, including a video. And in this message, um, somebody reached out to him after watching the show on the Joy News channel mm. and said that there's somebody who has been defiled, a little girl, and the matter has gone to the police. And it does appear after issuing the form, medical form to the girl, um, there's, there doesn't appear to be that much interest. And this is about a 42-year-old guy. Um, and could you, this is the very sad aspect. So throughout the morning, the, the song you have been playing, I've played it over and again, and just ask God to touch the heart of everybody so that there will be a revival, a revival in the sense that God can make it right again. Hmm. because things are just not right. Now, they defile this small girl in front of a container kiosk. Hmm. And it is by the roadside. Hey. And you see a four-wheel vehicle parked just by the place. And whilst this guy is in the process of this harrowing thing. You hear the little girl scream. And as a father, at that point, I just broke down. Now, the sad part of it is that this adult has another young adult by him and then later another one comes and they appear to be providing human shelter to cover for the guy to do this thing. What? So um, my senior 
gives me information that it does appear somebody is videoing this and you can tell they are in pain as they do it but they are doing it from a far point of place and you can tell they are scared to make an approach to confront these people because if they did they may be in trouble and i see a story building next and i you can see some people at the top and it's as if people are becoming aware that, that this is what is going on but as if they can't approach the violators of this small girl who was screaming Hey, what so, so I spent the morning trying to reach to the highest authority within the police as far as these matters are concerned. And I'm excited in the end, you know, the Dosu boss, you know, makes a, a commitment that she's going to intervene immediately and, and perhaps take over the, the case and ensure that these guys may not still be loitering or running around this community looking for the next victim. Um, so I'm, I'm being frank with you. I, I have been disabled completely from mm -hmm. continuing my work and I had just been in the office. It's been terrible for me, could you? So I was very excited when I heard you pray, uh, play that song that, you know, these guys uh, sing and say that they are praying to God, that God will open our eyes, mm. that um, we'll get back to those days. And that's what the song says. I wish you play it as often as possible. And I wish that you guys would take this crusade and continue so that we stop following the mundane that's happening in our country. Let's, let's take care of these things. Very important thing. It's our people of the future. When I wrote in May, um, uh, the, the article titled uh, 110,000 uh, girls impregnated, teens impregnated, and sex under 16 is, is crime. I was using these figures. The sad thing is that when I do my take like that, I get media from all over the country calling me to be the same person, to be the resource person. <laughs> and, and I can't afford to be doing that. I can't have my life if I do a take about a serious issue and I have to be the same person talking all over the place. You know, it's, it's not just, it's just not on. Yeah, so some, some people called me, but I just didn't, didn't you know, uh, comment. So I am happy that this issue has been brought back again. And you guys are focusing on it the way you are doing. But, but, but sorry, yeah. just a quick one. You know, I think yeah. that what Samson is describing actually also borders not just on defilement, but also on pedophilia. Absolutely. Uh -huh. So that's, that's another well, perspective I mean, I, I suppose, altogether. Yeah. I suppose any time no, you're no, talking but, about but, defilement... But, but, but Joyce, I'm just... I'm, Joyce, I'm yeah. beside myself. I'm asking yeah. uh, just how does this happen, yeah. this beastly thing yes. happen there's, there's in the open yeah. and, 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 and happens... Yeah with people providing human shelter hmm. for another person to do this happens hmm. by the roadside by a container shop and this girl is is screaming so, and so, then these residents are capturing this thing and there are people who are clearly uh, observing but they can't approach and i'm like just how does this happen on god's earth how do we put 110 girls, teenage girls. How does a, a girl, a child become the mother of a child? How does a child become the mother of a child? And this is happening in this country. And, and social, social protection, the laws, everything, the laws are there. So when I wrote, I asked the question, can we at least account for just 50% of the violators of this are uh, girls being prosecuted or going through some sort of you know accountability can we account for just about 50 percent of that number can we account for 20 percent at least where what are we doing 
what is society doing? What's what's wrong with us? Mm. So, so just so, what is wrong? Yeah. Um, something I remember the take back in May where you, you said that you were sad, angry and confused. I mean, this issue has gotten a lot of us sad and angry, what you just even shared this morning. So what have you discovered as you've been exploring the subject? What have you discovered that we can do uh, to curb the situation? Who should be responsible for what? Look, Mabi, let me tell you that in my many years of practice, you ask me how much faith I have in the law. And I'll tell you, very bluntly tell you, that the law is good. But to the extent that it remains on paper in this country, mostly, it's useless. So moral society, and unfortunately, religion is so guilty in these matters. Religion is so guilty in these matters. How many imams, how many pastors, have not gone to a mother and a parent to appeal that they shouldn't make the matter, you know, a police case because a breadwinner will suffer or because somebody who is as close to them will suffer. What nonsense? What is going on in this country? And I'm telling you, on my show, these experienced lawyers are telling me situations where police officers are involved in trying to negotiate a deal. And... and I have dealt with police officers and I, I, I am minded to say they may, be, they may be in the very small number, insignificant number. But again, ask yourself, I wrote this article about the medical form. When someone is violated and often it is women, girls, the law says they are supposed to be treated free of charge the domestic violence law uses free of charge. The, the, the hospital's uh, fees act uses free of charge. And yet, they are being charged for these things. And these people can't afford it. I, I was compelled to join a coalition that was formed by Irina Bochinyahe and others. Uh, Gifty anti Dems are there. Uh, and a host of some of your, your, your the lawyer, women lawyers you know, respected the coalition for survivors of domestic violence. And we put a position, position paper together to give to the stakeholders, duty bearers. When the girl and the parent can't afford, you know, 500 cities, 200 cities, and the person is violated sexually, and they go to police, they issue form, and they are going to the hospital, and they are being asked to pay 200, 500. They don't have it. They are poor. <laughs> In the end, some things very horrible happen. The violators will be the one to be taking care of these people, pay money so that they end the matter. They are doctors, health practitioners, who are working in a government hospital state hospital, all the equipment is bought and paid for by the state. The computer they use is paid for by the state. The, 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 the chair they sit on is paid for by the state. And yet they are charging the people who are coming for the medical you know, test, examination. Charging that money for who? They are paid at the end of the month. But can you blame them that much? Because in the course of the, the case in court, these doctors will be invited to come and testify to their reports. Hmm. When they go to the court, how much premium do we give to them? They sit in the well of the court, somewhere back in the, in the courtroom. And the case is not called from morning until 2 or 12 and they waste their whole day. They go to court today, it's agent. The next day, it's agent. And they are driving on their own fuel. Please, yeah. what is going on? <laughs> we, we can't solve these basic problems. Sounds and we are proud to call ourselves leaders at each level. Leaders at each, what kind of leadership is this? Samson, I want and we, you to stay with we us. all go to church, we all go to the mosque, and you pray, you pray to who? 
Some I say. have two girls living under me. Two girls, 15 and 18. One just turned 18. Even they, I can't imagine them suffering what I've seen this morning. Oh, Jesus. Samson, I, I want you to stay with us. Uh, we're going to take uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, when we come back, <laughs> uh, I also have a controversial question to ask. Shamima has some controversial suggestions when it comes to education, but you know what Samson has just done? He's painted a picture of the reality of our situation as a society. I mean, forget about the depravity of this forty-two-year-old person who has allegedly done this thing. Forget about the depravity of such a human being. Forget about the, 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 perversi the per perversity Definitely. of the two people who came along and shielded him. Forget about that. Think about the number of people who are in this open space, none of whom were able to stop this girl from being defiled. No matter how disgusted they were, they were unable to stop it from happening. That's the society we're living in today. I want you to think about it. If you send your daughter out to go and buy something for you, this could happen to her by the roadside with the whole world watching. It could happen. We'll talk more when we come back from these messages. Once again, Malcolm, your number one stop shop supermarket is getting bigger, better, and super mega. Great news here. Now with over 40,000 items under one roof ranging from electronics, homeware, kitchenware, furniture, home decor, electrical, supermarkets, and groceries. All these at one shop. Oh yeah, you heard right. Your shopping experience just got really better. Malcolm, your number one stop shop supermarket for all your daily needs. Terms and conditions apply. Malcolm, we're gonna shop. I don't know what to get for my mom on her birthday. I think I need something unique and authentic for the choir this year. Ooh, for me, I want a beautiful African print fabric to be used as souvenirs for my engagement. Hey, we need to get dad a new shirt when we visit him this weekend. For your authentic Woodin fabrics and ready-to-wear outfits made from exclusive designs, visit Woodin retail shops nationwide. Feeling good in Woodin? Make your loved ones feel good too. Woodin, le créateur. Wondering what to do with your Cerilac 400 gram tin? The new Cerilac Wheat 350 gram pouch value pack is the ideal choice to refill your tin. It is affordable, convenient, and still provides key nutrients, iron, vitamin A, B and D, zinc and iodine to support normal cognitive function and help promote optimum growth and development. Grab your value pack at a retail shop near you. Cerilac 350 gram, more for less. This advert is FDA approved. Imagine say water wake up at dawn. You know both. You know chop. Where it vanish for your area for two weeks. Uh -huh. You not get one drop self inside your tank. Hey. Hadja, our life was in dangerous. Only our neighbor get water with water tank. Water, water tank. tank? Yes, water tank. Mama mia. That water tank gets meter for checking water level. That water tank be fine past Masi Selindion. <laughs> that water tank be tough like Ghana Army. That water tank, they carry water pe -pe -pe, so say some no go left inside the supply tank. Mm. What a tank! Ask my boss who Mr. Foncho go talk. <laughs> Beautiful, durable, with water level indicator and accurate volume of water. Water tank. What a tank. By Duraplast. Yeah! Yes, SmartServe from Vodafone allows you to connect to super fast wireless internet anywhere and anytime at your own convenience. Whether home or office or on your, we move with seamless connectivity. Charlie, there's even more. Vodafone SmartServe connect up to 32 devices. Whoa, so now you can connect to the internet on your own terms, increase your productivity, make the most of the things that matter, and do so much more. Visit fvb.vodafone.com.gh or the nearest Vodafone shop today and get a smart self device now. A world of exciting possibilities awaits. Vodafone. Together, we can. 
Charlie, your office they sign no. Yes, so I be I tell you say for proper and modern ceiling solutions, the answer be Interface Limited. Them get in stock acoustic ceilings. We go fit make your office fine like my own. Or even better pass your own self. We can better pass my own. Charlie, I they go Interface right now. Interface Limited is the leading supplier and installer of finishing input materials for the building and construction industry in Ghana. Call us on 0274-999999 or visit our website at www.interfacelimited.net Facebook, Interface Limited GH Instagram, Interface.Limited DSTV is an unbeatable footballer in free soccer leagues at Kessie Nunyina. For 49 Ghana CDC Peshas here, enjoy a live match this week via the free the best leagues are a warrior say. Mess like you, we talk in the Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, the Champions League, Africa's Europa League in Sobek Kahu. Nothing beats the unbeatable football on DSTV. Terms and conditions apply. For 0302-740-540 for enquiries. DSTV. It's your moment. Coffee in your cup and joy on the set. The Super Morning Show is always, always the best, best bet on Joy 99.7 FM. You're welcome back. Today our conversation is about teenage pregnancy and already <laughs> we've been put in some kind of mood by the story that Samson has just shared with us about defilement happening in the open, in broad daylight by the roadside with, with onlookers and people even protecting the defiler while he does it. That's what our society is capable of now. We'll get back into this conversation in just a moment. First, though, you don't have to queue to watch a movie these days. You just have it streamed on your screen uh, in your living room. You don't have to go to the mall these days. You can shop online and have it delivered to your doorstep. Now, what if you could do the same with banking? Meet Abby, your 24-7 digital banking service from ABSA. Whether it's making inquiries, paying a friend, buying airtime, or checking your balance, just ask Abby to do it for you. Add Abby on WhatsApp. The number is 050-164-4644. That's Africanacity. That's APSA. Terms and conditions apply. Go to apsa.com.gh. And every other president of the Republic of Ghana travels globally to, among others, other things, shop Ghana's investment opportunities to the rest of the world. Now, how do we ignite a national passion to successfully onboard these FDIs? How should uh, facilitating agencies support prospective FDIs and how can every day Ghanaian partner or benefit from FDIs that are prospecting to come to Ghana? The Ghana Investment Promotion Center and the Ministry of Information present Spark Up 2021, an annual investment onboarding summit which connects investors, facilitators, facilitating agencies private sector, uh, private service providers, and the general public to unlock fully Ghana's investment potential. It is the single most important platform that connects all the dots in the FDI ecosystem. President Akufuado, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata, Trade Minister Alan Chamanting, heads of financial institutions, regulators, investors, and prospective investors, and everyone who matters in the world of FDI will be there. Spark up 2021 comes uh, off on Tuesday, the 7th of September, 2021 at the Kempiski uh, Hotel, Gold Coast City in Accra. The event is strictly by invitation and all COVID-19 protocols would be observed. Log on to sparkup.gipc.gov.gh. Register to participate now. Sparkup 2021, maximizing Ghana's investment potential. Now, send your dried fish to UK, the US, and Canada at any DHL-owned service point and enjoy a dedicated service which ensures quick and secure delivery. <laughs> That's new. Stay in touch with your distant relatives by sharing their, their delicious local Ghanaian delicacies. Enjoy discounted rates starting from 165 Ghana cities up to a weight of 2, two kilograms. This service is fast, it's secure, and it guarantees a quick delivery to the UK, US and Canada. If you want to know more, just call DHL on 0302-213090, uh, uh, okay, any of the numbers in between. Uh, send an email to ghsales at dhl.com. DHL, excellence simply delivered. Yeah, that's fascinating. It is. And wondering what to do with your Cerelac 400 gram tin hmm. or the new Cerelac with 350 gram pouch value pack is the ideal choice to refill your tin. 
It is affordable, convenient, and still provides key nutrients, iron, vitamins A, B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, B12, and D, zinc, and iodine to support normal cognitive function and help promote optimum growth and development. Grab your value pack at a retail shop near you. Serilac, 350 gram more for less. Mm. All right, so uh, let's get back to our conversation. We're talking about teenage pregnancy. We're figuring a way out of the cul-de-sac. And uh, Joyce Bawa Mukhtari is our guest in the studio. She's a lawyer. She's a special aide to uh, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. Shamima Muslim Al Hassan joins us via uh, Zoom. She's the convener of the Alliance for Women in Media Africa. That's AUMA. And uh, she's a youth development advocate. Samson Ladi Anyenini is the host of News File and The Law. Both uh, of them are shows on the Joy News channel. News File, of course, is on Joy 99.7 FM as well. And he's also a, a prominent Ghanaian lawyer and GJA's Journalist of the Year. Uh, we're also joined, and let's say a quick good morning to him now, by Kofi Asari. He's Executive Director of Africa Education Watch. Kofi, good morning to you. Africa Education Watch. Kofi, good morning to you. Hi, good morning to you and good morning to your panelists. Wonderful. Thank you very much for making the time. Now, uh, Kofi, I'm interested the in now, uh, the idea I'm of interested in children's, the idea of um, uh, children's futures um, being uh, cut short. Futures. Um, because they become sure. pregnant. I'm interested uh, in this idea because, because I'm not pregnant. sure why I'm that is the case. This idea. What's the problem in Ghana and why is it that when a girl gets pregnant, she's discouraged from going back to school? Well, uh, let me indicate that uh, we have uh, a legal and policy regime that focuses more on the repressive aspect of the law than the restitutive that than the restitutive aspect of the law. So when someone gets pregnant and the person is defiled, for instance, and, uh, the law is more interested in how the perpetrator is punished than how the girl or the victim is supported to survive their right to education. Because it is only through the restitutive support Girl will be supported to uh, reclaim her right to education, which may have been lost, um, especially at the basic level as she becomes pregnant. Bear in mind that 81% of pregnancies in the pre tertiary education sector happen in primary and junior high school, 80, 81. And so we are talking of someone between primary six and junior high school. Today. Um, getting pregnant, and we are talking about an, an average of about six thousand a year. And the likelihood of they not being able to continue their education, because even before the pregnancy came, there was considerable poverty at school. I mean, in the house. And so, immediately, um, the, the business of child, child, um, child bearing, and all that comes in. We would expect that poverty. All right, we have a very uh, bad. All right, we have a very. Let's uh, see if we can fix that and uh, hear more from Kofi uh, shortly. Um, but uh, let's come into the studio um, while we work on that line. Uh, and um, Joyce, I mean, on the, on the same issue um, of how a child's life can continue in spite of such a mishap. Already, I know a lot of progress has been made. There are uh, several parts of the country where active measures have been taken to ensure that children can continue schooling even after pregnancy, uh, after they, they, you know, they become pregnant. Um, but there, is, there are so many things fighting against that. Our culture is one of them. Uh, where do we begin to ensure that uh, you know, one mistake does not end a child's life? Well, Kojo, you do know that these also have some socioeconomic ramifications. Yes. It depends entirely on where the girl hails from, what her background is socially, and of course economically, where whoever her guardians are also stand in society. You know, half the time, most of these chilling stories that we share happen in our most deprived environments. Mm. To the children who actually need social protection more than any other. To the areas where policing, 
where civil society organizations, where there should be keen observations and activities going on to protect because they are largely exposed to the vagaries of society. Mm. For example, if a child in a certain uh, environment, a certain middle class environment, were actually to fall pregnant, even in primary sex, chances are such a child will be rehabilitated after the child has had a safe delivery. Chances are such a child has an environment that would at least encourage, and we have many examples, and I would not want to share any very personal stories here, but I do know a number of young children who actually come from certain backgrounds, who falling pregnant would return to school and get the support that they need. But remember the stigma also in some of these environments is why the girls will drop out eventually. Mm. Remember they will become the butt of jokes that culturally even there must be something wrong with you yeah. for a child to fall pregnant, have the baby and return to school. Mm. Then even in the cases where there are some prosecutions, if these prosecutions were to be made public, they would also go a long way to affecting the child's ability to be reintegrated into society. But on a more serious note, I have no doubt that in terms of the law, and I keep repeating this fact, that there are a lot of beautiful legislations, mm -hmm. that even government has taken steps not just to pass the Domestic Violence Act, mm -hmm. but even to establish a social protection ministry. Mm -hmm. We also have the social welfare. All of these things, coupled with the failures in prosecutions, mm -hmm. appear not to be working. We've also passed the law to create a fund even for pay for pay for absolutely medical, for. Uh, excellent uh, and we are even we also know that even most of these services especially for medical forms are actually free also mm. but we do know that whenever people who are violated and remember that when it comes to these sorts of sexual crimes mm -hmm. our boy children are not exempt yeah. yeah there are many young boys also who have been violated along the same lines as these girls yeah. So certainly GES actually had a policy which allowed for girls who had babies to be reintegrated. And last week, mm. one of the stories we reviewed here was from the Eastern region, where at least about 600 or so girls had returned to school. Mm. But for those who do not have a good social protection right. of a family or of the state or of some adult supporting them, and it is where our churches also can come in to provide a certain psychological, moral, and social support for these girls. Look, mm. government alone cannot go at it alone. The law itself somehow is not working because the emphasis is not on the things that matter. But the emphasis should also be on prevention and on solutions. Mm. I think that it is time for another conversation to take place. I know there have been many of these female-oriented civil society organizations yeah. that have done enormous work in this area. But yes, there's a certain fatigue also when there is no support in terms of a national policy supporting their activities. Mm. And I believe that Shemima reiterated that point beautifully a few days ago. Mm. We need to continue, one, with this conversation. Secondly, we need to get the participation of key stakeholders. And of course, educators, both lawyer and otherwise social uh, entrepreneurs, can all take up the responsibility to provide a certain guide as to what should be done and how it should be done. But mm. teachers in particular, for example, the statistics show that most of these young children are in schools where the stigma actually takes place. Mm. It's almost as if when girls used to have their periods and be teased out of school because they are unable to manage it well. Yeah. So this is another problem that has come up. I think that beyond asking them to go back to school, someone must follow up. There must be a certain effort to reintegrate these girls into society, to reorient them. But what happens to the children that these children are having? Mm. Because if you don't have anybody, for example, to take care of these children, how do you actually go back to school? If you come from these very poor environments, where most of these things are prevalent also. Mm. Who actually is responsible? In fact, most of even the grandmothers to these children themselves had them when they were also teenagers. Mm. And it's actually a cyclical thing also in some environments. I think that this conversation must go on. The, the very chilling story that Samson actually referred to is 
can actually become a benchmark to kickstart this conversation. But remember, we also have another breeding canker of child prostitutes. Yeah. Of child prostitutes. And if you have child prostitutes on the streets, there are certainly pedophiles who are actually taking advantage of these children, mm. who are paying for these services. And I've seen a few of these videos that actually portend more to the fact that there's a certain passive acceptance mm. of this breeding canker. I think that environments such as yours and platforms like yours have a very loud voice. I believe that you have started a very important conversation, mm. a social issue that everybody probably is overlooking or has forgotten. But I think it can be a new way to re-engage, to restart and kickstart a certain national conversation mm. around these matters. Mm. Because these children that we see today are actually representative of Ghana's future. Mm. And if the law is not working, it must be somebody's responsibility to ensure that it works. That social protection must mean just that. That there is every effort being made, one, for solutions. Two, to focus on prevention. But of course, it will happen. Even if the numbers were to go down, there will still be a few that these things will happen to, no matter what. I think that for those who are already pregnant, have had babies, they need medical care, they need psychological analysis, they need counseling. In some environments even, Kojo, mm. they actually give them housing. Yeah. They give them money. There are shelters where they can go to. Mm. They allow for them to take their children even for childcare while they go back to school or find work. And these are mostly 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds. Mm. In our part of the world, <laughs> there is really no national policy regarding funding for such activities. There is no benefit system. There is just not enough in terms of funding for social brackets. You know that even with the police, Forensics is still a challenge, yeah. and they talk about it all the time. So there is a whole logistical chain of mishaps that leads to these issues. And I think we need to find better ways to handle these matters. Mm. But conversations such as this, I believe this is the beginning, and we should go on. We, we, we have a fund, the Domestic Violence Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Amidu went to court, first of all, yeah. just so government can commit to the fund, and CSOs have been on this. Mm. There's really not nothing yeah. in it. And that's, that's what I was mentioning earlier, that for a, ch for a child to be defiled, go to the police, and then that mm -hmm. child's poor parents now have to go and find money to pay for her medical exam. When we have a law that establishes a fund which should be able to pay for such things. It's a pity. Anyway, um, uh, we, we have Kofi Asante on the, on the phone line now. Kofi, Kofi Asari, sorry, forgive me. Uh, on the phone line now, and I think we have a much clearer line. Kofi, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. I'm so sorry, but we missed almost everything you said uh, because the line uh, was bad to begin with. So uh, uh, if you don't mind just going over your point about um, uh, children, uh, you know, pregnant children not being able to go back to school. Yeah, the point I was making is that our law focuses over, overly on the restrictive, I mean, the repressive aspect of the law and how uh, offenders will be punished without giving adequate attention to the executive aspect of the law. Mm. That is how the right being lost by a system of defilement, if you like, um, will be restored by the state. And that is where we have a big challenge. Because within our basic education system alone, after 2018 2019, we are recording about 81% of pregnancy between primary and senior high school. I mean, basically, between primary school and senior high school, 81% of pregnancy in the pre-child sector happens. Now, we have a situation where these victims drop out, and the, the challenge is that they find it economically challenging to re-enter a teenage money, even though there is a re-entry policy for genes. The re-entry policy for genes is especially emphasizes awareness creation of the opportunity to re-enter and complete basic education. And also, in some instances, psychosocial support. But the greatest barrier to re-entry for teenage men is poverty. Because 
even before pregnancy, there was COVID, and pregnant and childbirth will only be in the public. And I think the mother more in the economic system to take care of the child who is likely not to have a responsible father. That is the challenge. So if you have a system that focuses on only punishing offenses as it as, as it were, and not supporting girls to reclaim their right to education, including a material support, then it's very challenging for girls to really read. We are launching a project sometimes with the support of Stars and Association to take part in national conversation about a, a developing a framework of personalizing things for providing material support for pregnant school girls and teenage mothers to be able to re-enter school and continue their business which is their life, beyond the awareness creation and then the social support. If such frameworks are developed, similar to what we have in Mali, similar to what we have in other countries in Southern Africa, where um, stipends are provided to support families of fat girls who are poor, it will at least prevent the teenage mother from going to do higher years when they are supposed to be in school. Because there would be something small at least to take care of the child at the end of the week or the month. That is one thing we think when introduced within the system, it will be you know, uh, impactful when it comes to strengthening that teenage mothers and pregnant mothers to return to school and complete their education. Okay, well, um, I mean, I suppose you, you, you've you articulated what the situation is, but I, we, can't, we can't run away from the fact that there are, as we're speaking, children across the country who are pregnant and stuck at home, and there are no further prospects for them. For the rest of their lives, all they will do is try and get a little bit of money from some man or the other to feed their child. So, I mean, it highlights the fact that more than ever, we need this sort of huge, large-scale campaign to start turning minds around. Now, Shamima, when, we, when I first mentioned this, you said you have some controversial ideas uh, around this idea of uh, having a, a large campaign. What are those ideas? Controversial, as, as it sounds. So, I mean, before that, let me just um, quickly go through a few um, issues regarding the impacts of teenage pregnancy. Because right, we are I, I, have to, I have to say that, at this oh, point, we have literally two minutes uh, for you, Shamima. Oh, so, you might have to okay, uh, summarize then, for us, please. Right. So, basically, in other jurisdictions, um, the proposals are that. All campaigns should look at how to encourage girls to delay the initiation of sexual intercourse. All campaigns must also include um, education on increased use of contraception, education about HIV, AIDS, and uh, sexual transmitted diseases, and that physicians or doctors, when they are counseling um, young people, especially young people, cutting them before their first sexual intercourse must speak about the link between prevention of pregnancy and the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases. Because adolescent pregnancy continues to be a major public health um, problem with lasting replications. And if you looked at the impact even on the children that these children are giving birth to. These children are often at a greater risk of preterm birth. They will often have low birth weight because you're talking about a very smallish child who is giving birth to another very small child. Um, usually mm. they have child abuse, there's neglect, there's poverty, there's even death in some of these you know, situations. So my proposal, and my daughter just entered, my proposal <laughs> for a national campaign is save the spam. We have focused a lot on the young girls abstain from sex, um, use condom. Mm. The effect is on the person who is carrying the pregnancy. 
I want us to conduct a campaign that focuses on the spend. And my operational uh, suggestion is it can be a national protect the sperm campaign or save the sperm campaign. Your sperm is your health. Your sperm is your wealth. Your sperm is your lineage. So protect the sperm. Wear a condom. Hmm. That's my title for a possible alternative campaign to encourage boys, especially before the first sexual intercourse, to become conscious about the use of using a condom. Because if at the first instant for both the girl and the boy, a condom is used, we are preventing the twin um, devils of STDs and possibly pregnancy. So their first sexual encounter is with a condom. So nobody is now going to say, oh, it's not nice with a condom or it's nice with a condom. They have started responsibly at the first instant. You protect the sperm, you protect the, your own life because you don't want to be sowing indiscriminate wild oats because we'll all be left with reaping indiscriminate what seeds and you don't want that. So let's protect the sperm. Let us save the sperm. It's your lineage. Wear a condom. Sure. I like that very much. Hmm. Save your sperm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that might catch on. Uh, Samson, I, I think I'm going to wrap up with you now and final, final thoughts on this one. Uh, look, uh, as we go into the future, uh, if indeed the solution here is a campaign, uh, 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 and maybe my question is also a little bit controversial. Um, these same Ghanaians who would look on while a child is being defiled or who will settle a defilement case at home, these same Ghanaians, if they travel to another country, they would adhere to the laws there. They wouldn't dare do any of the things that they would do here. So rather than spending a fortune on a, a, an education campaign, should we not rather spend a fortune on enforcement? Is that not a quicker way to the solution? So that people in Ghana will be just as afraid of committing the offense as they would be in other jurisdictions? Um, Ghana is noted to have the most, the most church buildings if you, if you walked a certain distance, say, of a certain kilometer or yeah, I've a couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, uh, there's an interruption. Yes, uh, we're, we're muting yeah. Shamima's uh, microphone for her. Okay. Uh, so, we, yeah, so you can go ahead. Now, in the, in the midst of all of that, where even places that used to be industries uh, have become church rooms, warehouses have become church rooms, we haven't stopped preaching the gospel. We continue to preach it. So regardless of how I feel about enforcement of the laws, I'll still advocate it, and I'll urge everyone to continue to advocate it. We should hold the duty bearers accountable, the district police officers in all the districts where all these young girls have been put in this very difficult circumstance, must be answering to a leader, and another leader, and another leader. There's a hierarchy who is answering to one. So I think that, for me, is where we start. You mentioned the Domestic Violence Fund. I will plead with you, take this as a campaign, and perhaps add the aspect of the medical you know, examination fees, which the law says we shouldn't take money, and yet we are taking money and discouraging people from reporting. Take that. You can add those two and do a campaign. Find out from the... Uh, the board members of this fund. And Mamavi mentioned the Martin Amidu. It was Martin Pebu she wanted to say. Oh, Martin Pebu had to go to mm. court to compel the state, to compel the state to enforce its own law. Well, I have done that before, so I know how it is. But I can't believe myself that I live in a country where the state makes a law 
and I, a private citizen, have to go to court mm -hmm. to compel the state to obey its own law, to enforce its own law. I don't get the logic. <laughs> so forgive me these days if some of you hear me so bluntly. It's out of frustration and disappointment. I think continuing to act as ostrich and being diplomatic has not brought us any results. We should call the duty bearers you know, out. They are failing. They have been very abysmal at the very lowest level. They have been very, very abysmal in the majority. And we should, we should do it this way. Otherwise, look, this country is heading nowhere. So the DV fund, Kojo, after Martin Kobo compelled the state to ensure that it is set up as spelled out in the law, ask yourself how much has accrued in the, into that fund. <laughs> ask yourself. The last time I checked, I was doing an article on it for my take. You won't find 10,000 in that, in that uh, fund. And that is supposed to help how many people all across the country people have victim uh, uh, have become victims of domestic violence and they have to go back and share room and bed with the people who are violating them what country is this hmm. how does this work you know um i will plead kojo have you ever had any leader at whatever level in this country mentioning the dv the domestic violence fund I haven't. Where are our priorities? Can we have the finance minister or government commit to the DV fund, that's the domestic violence fund, like it is doing for the cathedral now to raise mm. funds for it? Mm. Just just one percent. I'm pleading for just one percent of that sort of attention to populate the DV fund with money to assist women, girls who are in trouble. And these days, like Joyce mentioned, some men. A small number two are also in need. Yeah. The the medical thing that they are paying exams, you know, the tests that they are paying for the laws. All the laws say they shouldn't pay. Yeah. What does it take for the hospitals to ensure that the people go and don't pay? What does it take? It takes a one word, one word hmm. from one individual. That's all it takes. Samson, and it takes we're gonna, monitoring of this. We're, we're gonna we're gonna if, have to uh, wrap it up there, uh, but boy, you've said. If you want to chat, can we add yeah. it to N uh, NHIS? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good question. In fact, I mean, let's have a register. Let's have a register of violators, hmm. publicly publicized, yeah. so that we we'll continue to know the people who are violating our girls, and then deal with them in that direction. Yeah, unless, uh, you know, uh, as a society, if we don't even think that is wrong, then uh, I don't even know what that, what that will achieve. But thank you. Thank you so much, Samson, for that point. And uh, in fact, thanks to all of our guests, uh, Shamima, uh, as well as uh, Kofi and um, uh, uh, Joyce, uh, for, for, for making our conversation s such an intellectual one. We appreciate it so much. Uh, but look, the point is that in the end, leaders spend time and money on the things they care about. We have a constitution that says that in all things, we should put the interest of the child first. So why is it that the institutions that are responsible for child, children's welfare are so underfunded? If we are putting them first, how is it that we are spending more money on V8s than them? What matters to us? In the end, our society will be judged on how well we protect the vulnerable. If we can now defile children in the street, well, that's how well we are doing. There's more to come on the Super Morning Show, but uh, first let me remind you that at Glyco Life, they believe this is the time to protect your future with life insurance policies. Their products are designed to offer you peace of mind, especially in this COVID-19 era. Uh, so uh, please, policyholders, your claims are important. Go and visit Glyco Life at their offices or at glycolife.com to lodge your claims for prompt service. And please pay your premiums uh, via your chosen mode, whether it's Momo on 591 Four four one four seven three or e premium for micro insurance to safeguard your policies. The call center is ready to help you on zero two zero double two double two double one three. Contact them by their digital channels if you prefer. And uh, Glyco Life cares for your safety, so all officers are implementing the COVID nineteen protocols. Please practice social distancing, keep safe, and trust Glyco Life to cushion you for life.
Well, so let me tell you about the Plus One promo uh, by rent to own by cities and habitats. So under the planned city extension project, grab your house and get an additional room with the rent to own land and house ownership scheme. Under the planned city extension project, be smart. You can live in the rent to own state of the art, but affordable and secure cities and communities that breathe. Live in a carefully engineered city. This Plus One promo offer last up to the 31st of October 2021. Terms and conditions apply. It really matters where you buy a home or commercial property. Partner cities and habitats. Ningo Pram Pram District Assembly, supported by <clears throat> the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development and UN Habitat and others. Be smart, join affiliate housing cooperatives now for special benefits. Call or WhatsApp 0555 or 0577-911101. Visit our website, newacra.city, or the Project Management Center on the Central University Campus Mutual. The Plan City Extension Project Shipping Ghana's Urban Future. And here's one for Stella Career. Webster University is a private American university based in St. Louis, Missouri, USA, with international campuses across nine countries in North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. The Ghana com campus is conveniently located in East Legon off the Lagos Avenue. Open global doors when you earn a quality American graduate degree in international relations, business administration, or human resources management in just about 16 months. MBA student can choose a standard MBA or specialize in either marketing or corporate finance. Apply now to start your master's program during either um, August. Now you have the opportunity to do the October intake as well and get up to 30 percent in scholarship be among the first cohort of students for the new hr management program and enjoy a guaranteed 30 percent of tuition webster university ghana's campus is open for tours so book a visit to experience their modern facilities and uh, speak meet faculty and students call them on 054 012 0940 and visit webster.edu.gh for more information this is approved for use. Okay, I guess that's it for mm -hmm. Webster University. Absolutely, and uh, you should check out Webster University. Uh, we've got an important conversation coming up on the Super Morning Show. Uh, we'll be talking to our friends uh, who are helping us bring you this year's Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair, powered by the Plant City Extension Project uh, from Cities and Habitats under the theme Home Ownership to Buy or to Buy. <laughs> we'll be talking about that. to build sorry or to buy to build or to buy all right so we'll be talking about um, the first mini clinic our guests are echo bank cities and habitats uh, are also joining us stay tuned for that sparkling conversation after these what would you do if you have the choice to do anything in life build your dream house take very good care of your family and plan for a comfortable retirement plan a befitting funeral for your loved ones when they depart how would you live if you knew there was a friend waiting to support you on all of your life's choices? You have such a friend in Glyco Life Insurance. Glyco Life has all the plans to meet your life's needs. Your child's education, your life savings, your mortgage, funerals, redundancy and your retirement and takes the burden off your shoulders. So go ahead and live life to the fullest today with Glyco Life Insurance Plans. And remember that all our policies are hedged against inflation. Talk to Glyco Life on 0302-218-500 or 246-142. Also visit our website at www.glycolife.com or any of our branches nationwide for more information. Glyco Life, we cushion you for life. Glyco, we cushion you for life. Why do you allow coughs, cold and flu to ruin your happiness? You need